on the line here. Everybody who's watching this show needs to buy this book. You know, don't wait for the show to be over. Just go place your Amazon order now. Uh, the reason why is that there is no book that has been published that is like this book. This is a comprehensive account of every judicial nominee from George Washington until today. Who, who nominated, when they were nominated, how they were nominated, what their process looked like, what it didn't look like. It is an irreplaceable resource, and it's a fascinating read. Um, I am now in the process of revising my casebook, my constitutional law casebook for the fourth edition. And I have changed, and the casebook is taught in a narrative way from the founding until today. I've changed the narrative. I've added, I've enriched the narrative by relying on this book and citing this book in my casebook. So do buy this book. And one of the lessons that is revealed by this is something that Kerry has already alluded to. Uh, and that is, um, you learn from this history of Supreme Court nominations is that the Supreme Court nominating and confirmation process has always been political. It's always been political. And if you think about it for two seconds, you'll realize why it has to be political. That is because a politically elected president always chooses the Supreme Court nominee, and they are then confirmed by a politically elected Senate. So politics is baked in to the Supreme Court selection process and the confirmation process. So that because it's always political, though, doesn't mean it's always ideological. Whether it's ideological or not depends on whether there is a consensus that exists amongst the political elites, because that's the people who are doing nominating and confirmation, about how the Constitution should be interpreted. And for a great periods of our history, there has been that consensus. And whenever there's a consensus how the Constitution should be interpreted or what the proper role of the judiciary is in a constitutional republic, then all the, the only thing that judicial confirmation hearings are going to focus on is what we sometimes call qualifications. I mean, where did you go to law school? Uh, ha, what is your judicial experience? What is your judicial temperament? How smart are you? Those sorts of things. But as soon as there's a disagreement, about how the Constitution should be interpreted, then what we call judicial philosophy then becomes relevant. And ever since 1980, when Ronald Reagan was elected president, there started to be a, dis a disagreement that is reflected in the political party system between Republicans and Democrats as to how the Constitution should be interpreted. And that disagreement is only intensified as the Republican part of the two-party system has developed to the point where they initially were originally talking about judicial restraint and now talk about originalism um, and whether a judge is faithfully committed to adhering to the original meaning of the text of the Constitution. When the two parties have sorted themselves out along, uh, you might say ideological lines, but I would say judicial, philosoph judicial philosophical lines, you are then going to have a battle between the two parties over every nominee uh, because the nominees of the other party, they may be qualified in the sense of abilities and et cetera, but they are not going to share the judicial philosophy of the opposing party. So when the presidency is held in the same hands as the Senate, then you're going to see uh, a nominees that reflect those two, uh, the fact that there's a convergence. But when the presidency is held in the hands of a, a president of one party and the Senate is going to be held in the hands of the other party, then you're going to see compromise candidates put forward that are going to try to get past the confirmation hurdle of the other party. And this is going to reflect judicial philosophy in a nation that's divided about how the Constitution should be interpreted. Our nation is divided now, but we have at the moment unified government between the Senate and the president. So therefore we can expect the nominee who's going to reflect the political, the judicial philosophy of the, that is now being uh, promoted by the Republican part of the two party system. And there's going to be vociferous opposition by the Democrats on the same grounds. Um, I'm gonna pick up there with some questions for the panel and then we'll go to the audience questions. Thanks Professor Barnett on that because that raises a point here where we are at this moment in time, which is the same uh, party controlling the Senate and in the White House. And we've seen Senator McConnell say that's why this is different than uh, when President Obama nominated Merrick Garland. So that's why, you know, they're saying this is not hypocrisy, he's saying, because uh, you have this, the voters have decided and you've got a Republican controlled Senate and, you know, a Republican in the White House. Um, I'm going to just kind of get your thoughts on all of that, which is the news of the day. I mean, is um, historically, I mean, is is this uh, is this something that Jan, typically? Uh, uh, 
as, as I detail in, in the book, there, there have been 29 times uh, where we've had vacancies uh, in presidential election years. Uh, the president has made a nomination every one of those 29 times. Now, whether that nominee gets confirmed depends on, as what J Randy described, as whether we have united or divided government. Uh, overall, not just in the in the election year, uh, rates of confirmation for united government, that is the Senate and White House controlled by the same party, is about 90 percent. For divided government, it's just short of 60 percent. And that difference is accentuated in presidential election years. So hardly ever uh, when there's divided government is the nominee confirmed uh, and hardly ever when there's united government does the nominee not confirmed. Uh, one exception to that is fairly recent in 1968. Uh, that before Scalia was the most recent uh, election year uh, vacancy. And there, there was bipartisan opposition based on ethical concerns to the elevation of Justice Abe Fortas uh, to be uh, Chief Justice. But historically, we have had confirmations during uh, uh, united uh, periods of government, even during the lame duck. Uh, and this is interesting. Uh, even, for example, the most notably, uh, John Marshall, the great chief, uh, nominated by John Adams after Adams had lost his bid for re-election against Thomas Jefferson, and the Senate confirmed him then. And so uh, there's nothing new under the sun, really, in, in our long uh, path of American history. Well, that kind of yeah, goes to a lot of the questions. Well, they, they, I mean, let me just uh, kind of summarize. We're getting already a lot of questions uh, for our panel, and many of them are kind of along those lines, uh, Ilya, that... Uh, should um, we have one, should the replacement for Justice Ginsburg be left to the next president? Uh, should a vote occur? Is it proper for a vote to occur before the election? Is it proper for a vote to occur during the lame duck session? Obviously, historically, uh, that's happened. I mean, Carrie, do you want to jump in here? I'm sorry. I, didn't I was just going to say, I feel like everyone, no, I, it's, it's hard to when we're not in the same panel in front of each other, right? I was just going to say, I, I, I think anyone who wants to be able to fact check some of the numerous claims you're going to hear through these next few weeks going through this process, this is the book to do it because it's things like that where people say, well, you can't, you can't ever have a lame duck even a point. I don't know that we'll have a, an, a, a vote during a lame duck session, but for people who say it's illegitimate, well, no one said Chief Justice John Marshall, one of the you know most highly regarded chief justices, was illegitimate. So get the book, if only so you can be the one who, who's doing the fact checking and say, actually, you know, here it is on page twenty three. So and, and uh, I, it, should, I should I should add I should add if you go to if you go to supremedisorder.com, not only can you also buy the book there, which as Randy said is important, uh, but there's a statistical and historical appendix. So you can see uh, tables uh, of all the confirmations sliced and diced every way, politically, historically, time-wise, including some on lower court judges toward the end. So supremedisorder.com, uh, hopefully that can be a resource during this debate going forward. I'm going to go to some more audience questions, if that's okay. We're, we're getting some really good ones. And guys, submit your questions if you want to participate in the panel, and we'll get to as many as we possibly can in the next half hour or so. Um, and I apologize, you know, trying to read on a small phone some of the questions uh, at my age with this era, if I misspell your name. But we've got a question from Robert Avarantis. Again, my apologies, sir, if that's not right. Um, real issue with court packing, how do we stop the legislature from destroying the third branch check and balance? You know, we're seeing already now Democrats saying, fine, Trump, if President Trump puts a nominee on, we're, when Biden wins, we're just going to add two or three more. Anyone? Court packing? Is this a concern let, right let, now? Let, let, me, let me jump in Take on Take it away, this. Professor. There's a really important... There's a really important distinction you need to keep in mind. It applies to the court packing question. It also applies to the nomination and confirmation question. And that is the distinction between what's constitutional and what is normal or something to be accepted as a normal practice uh, by tradition or by whatever other standard you wish to apply. So with respect to constitutionality, the president has a constitutional power to nominate. The Senate has the constitutional power to confirm. There is no constitutional crisis, which is another term that's widely uh, used, when the president uses his power to nominate a justice now and a Senate would confirm the justice now or into the lame duck. It is perfectly constitutional. And by the same token, 
the Congress has the perfect power to change the composition of the Supreme Court. The number of justices set by the Constitution uh, 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 of the Supreme Court is set not by the Constitution, but it's set by Congress and has always been set by Congress. So Congress could pass a law as long as the House and the Senate agree and the president signs it into law or the House and the Senate override a presidential veto by a supermajority, the Congress is free to expand the number of justices if that, and even if motivated to do so by giving a politically elected president power to appoint a number of justices and tip the political balance or the ideological balance of the court. So we just have to distinguish between what's clearly constitutional and what clearly a matter of tradition and norms, uh, because these two things get run together. 350 law professors during in 2016 signed a letter which said that the, Consti that the Constitution required the Senate to give a nominee, they had a constitutional duty to give the nominee a hearing and a vote. The Constitution creates no such constitutional duty. It was well within the constitutional power of the Senate to advise and consent by withholding their consent to a nominee and not having any vote and not, and, and, and Ilya's book, demonstrate that that's, uh, there's been a lot of history of no votes and no consent that way. So please keep this in mind. Now, when we, if you want to shift the conversation to what is normal practice, what is abnormal practice, then you need a historical context like the kind this book provides. But that's the point that I think needs to be born. That's the most important takeaway from this conversation is that there is no constitutional problem with the president nominating, the Senate confirming or of the Congress deciding to change the number of the Supreme Court justices in order to so-called pack the court. Ilya, what are some of the lessons uh, that, that we can take from you know, the historical experience with court packing proposals and um, the addition of justices to get to a court of nine at this point anyway, and then proposals to even add to that? I mean, looking back, can you just kind of take us through that and then give us your uh, sense of Oh, how that may unfold now in real time. Sure. Um, I mean, historically, um, uh, we've had, uh, you know, there's no magic to the number, number nine. We've had 150 years of a nine justice court, uh, but the constitution doesn't specify the number of justices. Each expansion was historically accompanied by some political mischief. I mean, they, they typically were added when new circuits were added, but still there were some convenient political reasons. We, we talked about the nomination of uh, John Marshall. Uh, that was part of the Midnight Judges Act uh, that actually uh, expanded the number of judges that the, uh, the, uh, the, 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 that um, John Adams had to appoint, uh, but redu would have reduced the court to five members at its ne next vacancy to thwart the incoming president, Thomas Jefferson. A year later, Congress restored the court to six seats, which uh, one of the justices, Samuel Chase, opposed, leading to his impeachment, although he wasn't uh, removed. Uh, a seventh seat was added in 1807, in part because Jefferson now, uh, in control, wanted to temper or resist Chief Justice Marshall's Federalist, capital F, Federalist proclivities, although that was unsuccessful because whomever Jefferson appointed, they kept being under the sway of, of John Marshall. And then eighth and ninth seats were added uh, under uh, Andrew Jackson to try to reshape the court, which led to a bigger majority for Dred Scott. Uh, Roger Taney, Chief Justice Taney, was appointed by Jackson, and that uh, uh, facilitated or, or at least failed to forestall uh, the Civil War. A tenth seat was added uh, in 1863 during the Civil War to give Abraham Lincoln uh, more power, although that was never filled. And then uh, Andrew Johnson succeeded Lincoln and to prevent him from naming anyone, he was kind of a political uh, orphan by that point, uh, Congress cut the court down to seven members so that the next three departing justices wouldn't be replaced. And then eventually that was stabilized at nine uh, in 1869. Then of course we have Franklin Roosevelt, FDR's court packing scheme, hugely unpopular, lost the Democrats an incredible number of seats in the 1938 midterms, even though two years earlier, FDR himself had been uh, had been reelected overwhelmingly. So the history of uh, playing around with the numbers on the court shows that there are definite negative consequences, you know, maybe some short-term gain uh, if it's successful, but a long-term loss, both for the party that does it and uh, certainly for the country as a whole. So we've seen, I mean, even uh, uh, 
Vice President Biden has kind of suggested he would not be in favor of that. I mean, is that going to be enough to uh, kind of rein in any efforts to change the number of the courts, kind of that historical look back? Or do you think that this is going to be a real uh, push for Democrats if President Trump is able to get someone confirmed to replace Justice Ginsburg? Well, this Um, would, uh, having someone confirmed to, no, I'm sorry, Carrie, go ahead, please. (laughs) Okay, I'll just I'll just be quick and then I'll I'll, I'll let uh, the uh, uh, having uh, 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 President Trump's nominee be confirmed would certainly be felt as a provocation by the Democrats. And though even though Joe Biden and also Bernie Sanders, for that matter, and probably the only thing I agree with him on uh, is against uh, court packing. They were pretty much even though they were the finalists, but uh, they were pretty much the only two who were against court packing during the primaries. Um, with this further provocation, as it will be seen, it will be tough if the Democrats swept both the White House and the Senate to then prevent them from uh, from doing so. But, uh, uh, you know, who knows? And is that, let me uh, kind of ask it in a different way, uh, based on some of these questions that we're getting coming in. I mean, is that any reason then to, you know, for, for this Senate and this White House to take a pause? Or is this just Carrie? I mean, I is think- this just something that? Or Professor Burnett, I think. Randy. Yeah, I think that uh, because uh, most Democrat activists have been calling for the expansion of the courts in order to pack the courts for year uh, ever since uh, the Kavanaugh nomination, if not before, um, they certainly told us that this is what their intention was before any of this happened. The fact that they are now going to threaten the same thing they were threatening prom- they're now threatening to do what they promised to do before. Um, it's possible, I think, as Ilya said, that there may be a little more political momentum to doing it, even amongst their own base. So that would unify the Democratic base where some of them might have had prudential doubts. This is something that I think was on offer anyway. I, I really do think that if, if, the, if Joe Biden wins and if they take control of the Senate, we, we were going to see a court packing scheme no matter what. Um, and I think, we, I think now we will f- see a court packing scheme if that should happen, no matter what which means no matter what, how this nomination goes, we're going to see that. And that therefore does not provide any reason whatsoever to either do or refrain, either confirm or refrain from confirming whatever nominee we hear about this week. Exactly. Carrie, That's right. Yeah, I think that's exactly right. They've been saying they're going to do it. They've been promising they're going to do it. The only thing that's held them up is they haven't had the opportunity because they need the White House and the Senate as well as the House to be able to do it. If they get that, I think it's clear they're going to move forward on a court packing scheme at this point. And um, as Ilya pointed out, I think that's going to have real long term negative consequences for the court and the country. If it happens, Justice Ginsburg herself actually is in addition to Bernie Sanders, we're on record saying this is a bad idea. Don't do this. So it's ironic to see the party somehow to the left of both of those two very liberal um, uh, legal uh, li- liberal uh, icons there. But um, I so I hope it doesn't come to that. I think particularly in today's environment, it, the idea, is, as Sanders suggested, this could just lead to each party adds two more seats and two more seats and you get 87 members in the court. Uh, that would be very damaging as a whole. I think we need to to pull back from that cliff. Unfortunately, I think as long if there's an opportunity I, I don't see the Democrats doing that single-handedly. We, we, have heard a lot over the past, we have heard a lot over the past few years about norms. The norm of nine is a law. It's a very well entrenched norm, the norm of nine. And the norm of nine means each party vies for control of the court within that nine justice um, of setting. Uh, the idea that you would change the rules by adding justices, once again, it's constitutional to do so, but it will destroy the norm of nine. And by destroying the norm of nine, it's going to turn the number of Supreme Court justices into a political football from now and an indefinitely. And so the destruction of that norm will have serious costs for our political and judicial stability. Mm-hmm. But it would not be, as going back to your comments earlier and reflected in Another one of the questions, how would that be undone? I mean, that's then you would just get in what a tit for tat where we would go from 11 back to nine or 11 to 13. Is that the concern, too, is that all of a sudden instead of a norm of nine, which is something we're all very that's what the public thinks. That's the court nine. Every four to eight years, you go 
nine, 13, 15, whatever? Is that the concern? And how does that get undone? Exactly. One of the questions. It, it, exactly. It, it, it's all done statute. But so to have a chain require the House and Senate must be in the hands of the same party as the president. And then it nowadays they would have to they would have to vote to eliminate the legislative filibuster, which is currently a rule in the Senate. So they could do this on a, a, a pure majority vote. And since uh, Democrats have ab abolished the filibuster with respect to lower court nominees and then the Republicans did it with respect to the Supreme Court, I don't think there's going to be much hesitation to abolish the legislative filibuster for this re for on this issue. They'll try to narrow it to this issue. But I actually think Democrats want to abolish the legislative filibuster anyway generally. And so I think that's that also was something that was going to happen, um, uh, regardless of this happening today or this week or not. Oh, and how it gets you know, undone, it gets undone, by, it gets undone by another uh, pre, uh, situation right. in which the other party holds the Senate and the House and the presidency. And that it, it can't be undone before that happens. But that's what it would take to be undone by statute. Yeah. And even so, they all do serve life tenures under the Constitution. So you can't it's it's challenging to limit the number. So this is this is why those concerns would just keep on ballooning. And, right. and look, and if, right. we were designing the, if we were designing the court from the beginning, if, if we were writing on a blank slate, we might want 19 justices. You know, there, there would be fewer 10 to 9 decisions than 5 to 4 decisions now. And you could have one representative per circuit. Several of our circuits, I think, are too big right now, for example. Uh, but we're not writing on a blank slate. Both the political uh, and historical realities, as well as transition, even if everyone agreed we want to have 19 or, or 22, we could have an even number of justices for other reasons. Uh, but how do you get from here to there? It's uh, essentially, if you, if you get the political will to agree on that, then the problem you're trying to solve is kind of obviated at the front end. You know, I'm gonna, when I was covering some of the uh, judicial confirmation battles, uh, you know, going back um, really, I guess, you know, the late 90s and then in the early uh, 2000s, um, you know, I remember talking then um, some of the senators and, you know, Mitch McConnell memories are long in the U.S. Senate, you know, what goes around comes around. And so it seems like it's almost like they're like the Hatfields and McCoys, you know, when the Democrats do one thing, um, then the Republicans are going to then try something else. I think we've seen that with the Democrats use of the filibuster, uh, the nuclear option. And now, of course, uh, you know, the, the nuclear option being employed by Republicans for Supreme Court nominees. Um, I guess, you know, when we think about the just pitched battles that we feel like we're in now. One of the things, Ilya, you said at the beginning of our conversation and looking back at your book, it's so invaluable that we can see episodes in history. Where, what is this, like I said, to start the conversation, I don't remember ever covering anything like this. Um, I don't remember a point in our nation's history like this. Obviously there've been vacancies uh, to fill the seats of pioneering justices uh, like Thurgood Marshall by Clarence Thomas, uh, obviously different ideology. Um, what does this remind you of? At what moment now? Is there anything that, what is the closest parallel historically? I mean, timing wise, uh, you have uh, Dwight Eisenhower in 1956, um, a, a recess appointing Bill Brennan in October of 1956 ahead of the election, the Senate uh, just didn't want to come back into session. They were out of session. They were all out campaigning. And they said, we're not coming back for this. And he said, OK, I'll just recess appoint. But Brennan, right, who was known at the time to be uh, a liberal uh, progressive jurist, he had been on the Supreme Court of uh, New Jersey for a while. And uh, Eisenhower made the political calculation that well, forget about jurisprudence for a while. I need to shore up my northeastern support, especially in metropolitan areas, heavily with Catholics. And that worked for him politically, although he would come to regret the jurisprudential outcome. Carrie, what would you say? What does this remind you of? And how would you predict this battle will go, having been so closely involved in covering the, the battle to replace um, Justice Kennedy? Yeah. So the one that you alluded to that that strikes me as similar in a lot of ways is the Thurgood Marshall to Clarence Thomas shift where you have 
one of the most liberal members of the court going to one of the most conservative members of the court. And uh, it kind and of, it kind of is very important for Justice Thomas. Right. Yes, I I worked for Justice Thomas, so um, I'm I'm a huge fan of his, and obviously, uh, you know, have read and learned a lot about that confirmation process as a result of knowing him. I'd highly recommend his book, My Grandfather's Son, for anyone's his autobiography for anyone who's interested in in learning more about it. But it was a a huge. Uh, I think this goes back to Ilya's point that he makes in the book about the stakes of the confirmation battle or what drives the insanity, um, and that was a really wild confirmation process for those who are too young to have watched it. This was the Brett Kavanaugh, you know, everyone's watching this live 24 seven on TV at the time with Anita Hill making these last minute allegations, getting leaked to the media, et cetera. Um, even his earlier, before the these allegations came out, even the earlier part of the process was very hostile and, and very critical of him. And it also, I think, could have parallels with this where you say, where it kind of, you know, puts, puts the lie to this idea of, well, there's, there's, um, interest group seats in the court. Well, you know what? There, You can have one black man replaced by another black man, but they could be diametrically opposed like Marshall and uh, and Thomas is. So there's no such thing as a, a, a black seat that votes one way or a woman's seat that votes one way. And I think so you may, you may see a little bit of that this time. I think it's also interesting that with Marshall, I think Elliot talks about this, he, he had said, you know, if, if I die, just prop me up and keep on voting. He really didn't want to leave during the tenure of a Republican president. But ultimately, in his case, he ended up, uh, for health reasons, stepping down. Uh, but obviously, Ginsburg herself also didn't really want to leave right now at the court, but ends up being replaced by someone who's going to um, bring in a judge who, again, may, may have some uh, parallels in their life story or other things, but certainly will be jurisprudentially a change on the court. You know, this reminds me of something, though, that we've seen recently. Um, there's been a lot of um, uh, kind of anguish among uh, people on the left and Democrats that she didn't retire when President Obama was in the White House. Uh, if only she'd retired then. And why didn't she? Uh, but historically, Ilya, do justices tend to like make decisions based on who's in the White House? I mean, I know the Chief Justice William Rehnquist, a lot of Republicans in which he had retired during President Bush's first term. Uh, sometimes they do, sometimes they don't. Um, I mentioned 1956. <laughs> no, that was after a series. Really that was a, right. That was after a series of of heart attacks and other uh, illnesses of Sherman Minton and otherwise forgettable justice. Um, uh, you know, they're not always uh, able to do so. Uh, and uh, the trappings of power and the prestige and being at the pinnacle of your profession of the legal profession. Uh, that's a lot. And so, yeah, I mean, uh, if she had retired in 2013, uh, already at 80 years old, uh, old, uh, pretty old already, um, then we wouldn't be where we are now. Yeah. Um, let me go to a couple more questions from the audience. We've got about uh, 10 or 12 minutes left. And, you know, this is kind of a more of a, a big picture question, going back to some of the things that you were talking about earlier, um, Ilya. Uh, from uh, Jay Wright. Does the philosophy of a living constitution guarantee a contentious confirmation process as everyone will want to know what moral principles the nominee would read into the constitution? And there is disagreement over acceptance of each nominee's personal principles. And I'm sorry uh, that my house phone is ringing. Well, I'm actually my parents. Are the, there's a phone ringing in the background, so I'm sorry if that's distracting. <laughs> But anyway, the prince of the idea um, from a uh, question from Jay Wright, the philosophy of a living constitution guaranteeing a contentious confirmation process. Yes. Well, no. that's one half of it. Well, that, that's one half of it. The, the, the divergent uh, issues. Absolutely. If, if you're a, uh, if you like the living constitution or pragmatic or purposivist uh, idea of interpretation, then you're not going to like the originalist or textualist uh, methodology and, and vice versa. So that is absolutely why we're currently at loggerheads. Now, I, I and I think in addition to that, um, it, uh, I, and I think this is what the questioner is asking, and I agree with this, and that is that if your view of judging is that judges get to amend the Constitution, uh, five justices, the rule of five, five justices get to amend the Constitution, um, then obviously it makes a huge bit of difference who the judges are. You want judges who are going to amend the Constitution your way. Um, if you think the Constitution is fixed, the meaning of the Constitution is fixed, and that any lawyer ought to be able to read it in good faith, then it becomes less necessary to have your justices on. So there are, that's one of two things that causes confirmation hearings to be so contentious. 
what is your theory of interpretation? Is it open-ended enough to allow the judges to amend the Constitution to make it read the way you politically want it to read? The second reason is what Ilya mentioned in his opening remarks, and that is the more issues, social or otherwise, you put make at the national level, the more important you make the Supreme Court in adjudicating these issues. Conversely, the more issues that under our original system of federalism, which if we had the original meaning of the Constitution back, we would have more of, uh, these issues would be decided at the state level. You would have 50 state solutions, both the social and economic problems, and that would de-escalate. And so California would have one set of rules and New York would have a set of rules and Florida would and Texas would, et cetera. If we could de-escalate most of these issues to the state level, there'd be less for the Supreme Court to fight about um, whether it was a living constitutionalist Supreme Court or a textualist Supreme Court. So you have both of these issues that are pushing everything up to the national level and pushing then everything at the national level to the court. And that's where we are where we are with respect to judicial nominations. Jan, you're muted. Oh, sorry. I muted my phone because the ring. This is to me, by the way, just as an aside, I am not the most technologically, my kids will laugh about this, a, a depth person. The fact that I'm trying to moderate a panel on Vimeo is, you know, blows my, I'm, I'm trying. So thank you. Um, well, well, as so, we learn the from the uh, telephonic oral arguments, the, the justices are just like us, right? The toilet flush and the forgetting to <laughs> unmute. So... If, if, if they if it happens to them, I, I'm okay with it happening here. Okay, good. Thank you. Well, thank you for uh, your patience. Um, but let, let's let's kick this back up to the news of the day and Justice Ginsburg and now, of course, President Trump uh, saying that he's going to have a nomination um, Friday or Saturday. He's got a working shortlist, he says, of five women. Uh, we know who, maybe a pretty good idea who the leading contenders are, including one he's already interviewed, Amy Coney Barrett. Uh, uh, Professor Barnett, you uh, can tell us uh, how you know some of the, uh, I guess, did you guys work? Did you know her from working with her or do you have any, did you, were you at Notre Dame ever with her? No, I'm mean, remembering that wrong. No? Okay. No. Um, never mind that. So, okay. So at any rate, she uh, is kind of the presumptive front runner. But then we've seen uh, Barbara Lagoa uh, from the 11th Circuit uh, with an incredibly compelling personal story in a key swing state, uh, Columbia Law School graduate like Justice Ginsburg was, uh, really gaining some momentum now. And then there are several others on the list as well, including a couple other federal appeals court judges. Um, we're getting a question from um, Anonymous. So, and it's not really that controversial question, so you could have given your name. Do you have an opinion on which would have a better chance for success? Holding this confirmation vote now, and we know it's going to be a female justice, um, before the election or after the election? And I'm gonna add on to this question. Uh, you know, how does politics, how do we think the politics of this selection uh, you know, is, is going to come into play and who the president ultimately decides. I mean, Florida is a key swing state. Trump has made no secret of the fact that he wants to win Florida. Uh, so it's kind of a jumble of, of different things uh, from our anonymous. And there was some of mine stuck onto that. But let's look at where we are right now. We've got potentially five women on the short list, a nomination coming on uh, Friday or Saturday, it's a possible vote before the election or in the lame duck which would have more of a chance of success? And does it matter? I think when trying to figure out what's going to happen, it's, it's, it's a mistake to try to extrap extrapolate from where we are to election day because something big is going to happen between now and election day. And that is Senate judicial nomina committee nomination hearings are going to happen. If the Republicans have hearings, those hearings will happen. What happens at those hearings is going to affect the politics of the situation. What happened at the Justice Kavanaugh hearings affected the politics of that nomination in a way that could not have been foreseen when he was picked as a nominee that I think the White House thought was going to be relatively easily confirmable. They didn't anticipate what was going to happen. But we can anticipate one thing. The Democratic vice presidential nominee is a member of the Senate Judiciary Committee. So one thing we're going to see if hearings are held between now and November 
is the Senate is the is the Democratic vice presidential nominee questioning whichever and we now can assume whichever woman has been nominated by the president to this to this post, how that exchange comes off, how how Senator Harris comes off in that exchange, how the nominee comes off in that exchange is going to dictate a lot about the politics of what happens after that. And, you know, we can all make our private predictions of how that exchange is going to go, but we're not going to know until we see it. And that's going to change the politics of this nomination and this confirmation, as well as the likelihood of an actual Senate vote um, before uh, before November or after November. Carrie, I uh, covered the, uh, obviously we were in the, I was in the room for the uh, Kavanaugh confirmation hearings and I thought uh, Kamala Harris in her questioning seemed to be trying to make a point and get somewhere. Um, I didn't think her questioning particularly was that effective of Justice Kavanaugh. Um, what are the stakes for her then? I mean, that's, uh, Randy, I hadn't even thought about that, actually. That's an excellent point. I mean, what are the stakes for her and for this nomination? And then I'm going to, if you want to all take a final word, uh, we've got about five minutes left, but I'd like to let Ilya have the last word. Yeah, I, I agree, Jan. I think um, Kamala Harris seemed to be using the Kavanaugh confirmation as an attempt to build her national profile. This was right before she had announced her presidential bid. And there was this series of gotcha questions she seemed to be trying to set up for uh, then Judge Kavanaugh, where she was talking about, did you, have you talked to anyone about, about the Mueller investigation at this law firm? And he's going, this is the law firm with 300 people. I'm not, what, who are you talking about? And she goes, oh, I think we both know who you're talking about. So it seemed like, oh gosh, she's got something on him. What does she have? And it turned out by the next day when Kavanaugh had a chance to review this 300 person list of people at the law firm, uh, he, he could confirm at, um, on under oath, yes, I, I, I didn't think I had talked to anyone. And now I can confirm I had not talked to anyone. And she just kind of was like, oh, okay, well, that, that I just wanted to know. And, and so everyone thought, you know, what, what was this fishing expedition that she was going on? It didn't, it really fell flat. It didn't help her, I don't think. Although she did use that exchange and some of her other exchanges to run literally thousands of Facebook ads <laughs> to try to raise her profile at the time. So uh, we'll see. I, I think Randy's right. It's going to be, that's going to be kind of another angle on the vice presidential debates almost. It gets her, she gets a, a shot to do that, but I don't know if she will do herself any more favors in this one than last time. We also know that Harris has a record of making anti-Catholic attacks on judicial nominees, including a nominee that she uh, was uh, criticizing for being a member of the Knights of Columbus, which is a large charitable organization, uh, and, and basically started saying, suggesting that you know if he believed what the church teaches, then he isn't fit for judicial office, which sounds a lot like a, judici a religious test for office, which would be unconstitutional. That's a, a, a she could go down with both Amy Coney Barrett, who's already been there, or Barbara Lagoa, who herself is Catholic, Allison uh, Jones Rushing, who is who is a, 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 a Protestant Christian. But I mean, you could see her going down those routes. I think that would be a mistake too. We'll we'll see how that um, that turns out. But it's going to be interesting to see. You know, once we have one of these women, I think they all have really compelling stories. So I think that's also going to change the. Um, the tenor of this, but Leader McConnell very well knows how to count to 50. And I think he'll he'll take the vote when he thinks he needs to to get to that number. Um, Professor Barnett, uh, any uh, final words before we let Ilya? I think it's only fair to let Ilya have the last word. What do you guys? Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. My my last my last word is by Ilya's book, also by Carrie's book and by Jan's book. All th it, those are the three books you need to have in <laughs> and front by of Randy's you book. want to understand. But my, my book is less about this than you guys' book are. These are the three, these are the three must-have books to understand the, the, what we're about to go through. If you read all these three books, you're going to know more than any constitutional law professor in the country who has not read these three books. <laughs> uh, well, thank you. I like that last those... word. <laughs> Thanks for all those kind words. And certainly by, more uh, than most of you. the experts that you're going to hear talking about it on television. Certainly, exactly. certainly more than most experts you're talking about on television, except for Ilya, of course, or Carrie, or um, <laughs> on social media. Um, so I just, uh, Ilya, I, I want to just, you know, help us as you do so well, uh, kind of wrap this up and draw all these threads that we've talked about today together. Uh, where are where we've been, where we are, and what we should expect. 
And again, thank you for, for the book. I mean, as Carrie said, and as Professor Barnett said, it's, uh, uh, I mean, it, it, it is the book you need right now and it couldn't have come at a better time. So thank you for writing it. Well, thanks for, for those kind words, Jan, and, and for blurbing it, and, and Randy for blurbing it, and, and Carrie for having written your book, because I, I couldn't have written the Kavanaugh chapter so so easily without that to draw on. Uh, look, uh, there are uh, half a dozen or so lessons that we can draw from the whole sweep of our uh, political confirmations uh, that are as ac applicable in the current situation as, as they ever are. They're kind of evergreens brought to modern life. Uh, first of all, politics has always been part of the process. You can't remove it, as, as Randy discussed. Um, confirmation fights now are driven by political philosophy, or judicial philosophy, rather. That's a little different than this, the way that politics has played a role in the past. And modern confirmations are different because the political culture uh, is, uh, is different. You know, modern life, even if the rhetoric is just as demagogic or, or even more so uh, in 1820 than it is now, uh, modern political culture and polarization works differently. Uh, next, hearings have become kabuki theater. I, mean, I actually come out, one of the more controversial statements I make in my book is I come out against public confirmation hearings for Supreme Court nominees. I think they, uh, overall for our public discourse, they add more heat than light. There's a greater cost uh, than benefit. We can all learn about the nominees' writings and backgrounds and what have you. And if there's sensitive things, the FBI background reports, those are already covered in the closed hearings. Uh, next, every nomination can have a significant impact. Certainly, this one more than a lot of them. Uh, big this would mark a big shift uh, from the left uh, uh, to the right, no matter uh, who from the shortlist ends up being picked. Uh, and um, uh, the hardest confirmations, of course, come when there, there is a potential for that big shift. And finally, the reason why we have these big battles and why we're all kind of in a frenzy right now is because the court rules on so many controversies making the political battles in this zero-sum game unavoidable. And so, uh, again, I don't have any easy answers because it's taken us decades uh, to get to where we are now, and it will take decades to unwind. But thanks very much, everyone. All right. Well, thank you, uh, Ilya Shapiro. And thanks to Takedo for hosting this. I'm sorry about the technical difficulties we had. So thank you all for sticking with us and your questions. Um, uh, Carrie Severino, Randy Barnett, uh, thanks as always for your incredible insights. I look forward to hearing uh, what you guys have to say in the weeks and months ahead as this unfolds um, and how uh, it all unfolds. But thank you all very much for joining us. and. Uh, Let's try to do this again.